This episode of the Answer is Yes Baja Sessions is brought to you by Baja Bound Insurance Services. Driving to Mexico? You can buy and print out your Mexican auto insurance policy online in minutes with their easy-to-use website. They also have great travel information to help you plan your trip south of the border. Visit BajaBound.com, the easiest way to get Mexican auto insurance. Hello and welcome to the Answer is Yes podcast. Really appreciate you tuning in and all your comments the last week about our shows. I often get the feedback via Facebook or Twitter or even Instagram, so thanks for that. We try to uh, keep it interesting and have some great people on the show. Well, it's been Christmas week, and I apologize. Blame it on me. I took a couple extra days off and did not get our show out on Wednesday, so it is Saturday. And believe it or not, this is our second time recording the show, unfortunately. Um, We had a wonderful interview yesterday, posted the show up, and for some reason we were having a technical difficulty. So if for some reason you downloaded this and you only got half the interview, that's my fault. Over 60 shows so far, and I've had two sound issues yesterday being the second. So again, I apologize. But we're going to re-record. I called my guest and let him know, and he's happy to call in here in a couple minutes, and we'll shoot another show out there. But in the meantime, I've just uh, been celebrating Christmas with my girls, enjoying the season, um, actually wrapping up Christmas as of this morning, we pulled the tree down and got it out to the dumpster and getting ready for New Year's Eve. I get to go out to the desert and spend it with one of my good friends, Ryan Arciero and his family. I've interviewed him on the Baja Session show. And if you know, he is a Baja expert champion racer and, uh, just all around good guys. So I'd love to hear from you and hear how you're spending your holiday. Reach out. You know, um, part of my cleanup routine, I always try to throw on some good music and uh, happen to be playing some 80s flashback. Matter of fact, I went to a wedding last night that had a flashback 80s band. It was just so much fun. And, uh, you know, if you come from that area, you know that the music was great, the movies were great, and uh, just an all-around interesting time of our lives. And that's what makes this next guest so interesting to me, is that he has written some books about the 80s. And uh, with that being said, I'm going to get him on the line and bring him on the air so that you can hear his story. So, hey, Chris, uh, I just let everybody know that I've got you on the phone. How are you today? I'm doing great, Jim. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate the time. Yeah, well, I also fessed up to the in the pre that uh, we recorded this yesterday. So <laughs> I, I came clean with my listeners. So here we are, deja vu, running it again. Well, the time, the time times too, so that's good. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, you know, it might be a little bit challenging to have the exact same conversation we had yesterday, but it was really fruitful for me. You know, I, I finished my day off thinking about our conversation and how valuable that was, and I had a really good conversation with my aunt last night that's gone through some struggles, and, and we talked about saying yes to me, and uh, I know later on in, in the interview we'll talk about saying yes to you, but um, you told me that when your career started off or really what kicked off the difference was you heading south from your, from your hometown down to Florida with 300 bucks in your pocket to become a bellman. And, uh, can you tell us where you're, where you're from and how far did you travel to get to Disney to be a bellman? Sure. Uh, North Carolina at Elon university, which was, uh, Elon college back then. And I don't, not sure that I could get in there now. It's a very, very, very good school. And, uh, and I fell in love with the campus and, and spent four years there and then came home to Baltimore. And uh, when I came home to Baltimore, um, I guess for lack of better phrasing, I realized I didn't want to be born, uh, grow up, kind of live and then die in the same town. I, I, I felt like I needed something more. And uh, I decided that it was either going to be Florida or California. I always enjoyed the sun. And Florida was somewhere that I had visited on spring break, so that was kind of how I made the decision. I knew one person in Orlando, a friend of mine from college, and that was it. And so I had worked uh, waiting tables at Ruby Tuesday uh, Restaurant at the local mall, uh-huh. and uh, I, myself and my mom and my sister and my best friend Dexter um, – Went up there for lunch, and uh, I got in one car, and they got in the other, and off I went. And I had $300 burning a hole in my pocket, and I, uh, I took my time, actually. I drove – you know, this was back in 1993, so no cell phones, uh, no internet, no capability to reach anybody unless you stopped at someone's house or you stopped at a payphone. <laughs> and I took about I took about 11 days, I think, to get down there and, and stopped in different cities, said hello to friends, checked things out, and uh, got to Orlando and actually still had a few dollars in my pocket. 
Yeah. Well, you know, you took a big leap of faith. I love that you brought up the fact that that's when we didn't have cell phones. So <laughs> you did. You had to stop at a friend's house or use a pay phone or wait till you got somewhere, right? We we really didn't even have email in the 80s, right? No, we didn't. And in 1993, there was really, I mean, I don't even, I'm not even sure if I recall, maybe we were just on the edge of getting, you know, pagers were, were relevant, I guess. So we had them for a couple of years, but uh, that was it. And so, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was awesome. And that was the first time that I kind of, I, I realized you know, saying yes to me was a huge thing. Yeah. I probably had done, I'd, I'd probably done it as a teenager, but it wasn't the same. It wasn't for the same reasons. It wasn't in the same way that you really thought and that was the first time I said yes to me. Yeah. Well, you know, we must have been very well organized back then, getting stuff done with the lack of pagers, emails, and all that, you know, uh, cell phones and all that stuff. So you, you land here as a bellman and take these random jobs. And what was your thought process behind that? Where, where were you headed? Yeah, so I uh, I took a job. Uh, my buddy helped me get a job at, uh, at Disney as a bellman. And uh, I was kind of finding my way a little bit. I had, uh, I was, yeah, I bounced at bars. I had worked in restaurants, and I was a bellman in a hotel. This is the second hotel I've been a bellman in, and I really enjoyed the Disney experience. There's some great lessons you can learn, even as a bellman. Um, they do a really great job of teaching you really valuable lessons for fu- for the future when you move into your career and your business, and also just kind of the way to interact with people in general and, and, and to be kind and, and provide a smile. It's just a simple thing to do. Yeah. And uh, so I, I actually, I thought, wow, like, you know, maybe move into marketing and Disney marketing was something I was always interested in. I grew up in a creative household. And so I was always, I always enjoyed marketing, even though I had a communications degree. Uh, the marketing was the piece that was really, I thought I, I found fascinating and intriguing. And uh, Disney is very difficult to break into with marketing. And so uh, at the time, Planet Hollywood, this was now, you know, with that flash forward to 1995 and Planet Hollywood was um, at the height of its popularity. There was a huge Planet Hollywood, Orlando, uh, right on Disney property. And I got a job there and uh, figured maybe this was a better way to get in or an easier way to get into marketing. Yeah. I'd have access to the right people. And so I took a job as a busboy and, uh, you know, I went home every night with other people's food on my clothing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was <laughs> – but uh, I did that, you know, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that um, – you know, it was an opportunity for me to get in front of the marketing director. I knew that she ran the large events and, and, and parties inside of Planet Hollywood Orlando. And there was two ways to really get in front of uh, her if I was going to try to get into marketing. One was a busboy and the other was doing security, which I did as well. And I did some security for celebrities, which we could do a whole other podcast on. That was, yeah, a, I bet. that was a really, really interesting experience. Uh, a lot of fun, great stories. So, uh, yeah, so I went home every night with other people's food on me, and um, I kept putting my resume in front of her. I kept leaving it behind at the parties. I put it on the table and everywhere I could until I figured she'd get sick of seeing it and ask me, what do you want to do? You know, what, okay, you've you given me your resume 100 times. Tell me what you want to do. And that's exactly what happened. And so I ended up getting a job as a marketing coordinator. Uh, they sent me to different cities to set up concierge programs where we you know, drive hotel guests into the local Planet Hollywoods. And so that's that's basically how it happened. And I think you and I talked yesterday too. And I know you, your experience with In-N-Out Burger, and um, I'm sure your listeners are very aware of that. And and I do think like you that everybody, every kid should have to work in a restaurant or a hospitality setting or a customer service setting. Uh, I think it should be an absolute must. You you learn an awful lot from it. And you know when you carry your you know other people's food home with you every day, um, it teaches you a lot. Yeah, well, I think just the service industry in general, you have the opportunity to be in front of a lot of people in a short time period, you know, or, you know, one shift, uh, a number of different personalities dealing with problems throughout those shifts, but really opening up and discovering what it is like to communicate with, uh, with strangers, you know, saying hello, welcome, things like that, asking them what they need or them having needs and coming to you. You know, you're absolutely right. The service industry can provide a volume of background and lessons for somebody to start their careers. And, you know, one of the things that I wanted to bring up that I just think is incredible about what you did is you knew where you wanted to be, and that was in marketing at this incredible company, um, you know, what you call Planet Hollywood. But you were willing to take a job as a busboy to get there. And I think oftentimes, especially in this day and age, people think that they expect – you know, I've got my college degree. I'm going to go right to the top. I'm going to make that hundred thousand dollar salary, and that's just not how it works. You know, there's a path to success, and and sometimes that path isn't the easiest one. Sometimes it's becoming the busboy and leaving that resume at the director's, 
lap every single time, and you did that. And I love that you had the uh, the forethought to go down that road. Yeah, I, you know, I think I guess maybe um, it's instilled. A lot of that is instilled by your parents to you know work for the things that you want, work for the things that you believe in. And uh, another part was just you know again from my perspective. Uh, that was what I wanted to do. And there really, you know, maybe there are some shortcuts here and there in certain things, but I think when you take shortcuts, um, eventually it catches up to you. And so having that experience really, it teaches you a really valuable lesson about, um, A, you know, what it could be. I mean, remember, there are people who th- their, their career, their life, their livelihood is going to be what I did as a stepping stone to get to where I wanted to go. And I was lucky enough to be and blessed enough to be and not have an opportunity to continue and further my career. That was a stepping stone for me, but it teaches you a really valuable lesson about respect and respecting people and their jobs and the things that they do. And you forget sometimes it's something as simple as going out to dinner. How many people are involved in that one, uh, that one, that, that process that you do of going out to dinner. We don't sometimes think about it. We sit down at the table, the food comes, we eat it, we go home. There are a lot of people who are, who have jobs that are surrounding that particular dinner that you had and that's their livelihood. And it's not easy. Yeah. Um, I can tell you firsthand, it's, it's, it's a difficult job. It's a rewarding job. I think I loved working in a restaurant. I, I miss the camaraderie. Sometimes I miss the, you know, going out with people after work and it's a really fun industry, but it, it can be a challenging one. And for somebody who chooses it as a career, you know, we have to take a step back and, and just respect the fact that a lot of people do that. And that, be, you know, when you go to dinner for an hour, there's a lot of people involved in making sure that you have a great dinner. And it's not just the person who puts the food on your table and it's not the person who prepares it. It's all these other jobs in between. Yeah. You know, I love bottom up businesses, meaning people that work their way up from the bottom, because imagine if you dropped in at Planet Hollywood, they hired you directly into marketing. You wouldn't really know as much about the operation as you actually learned as a bus boy. And then, you know, throughout the different positions you might have held at those lower levels, it just makes you a better marketer or a better executive or a better person at the top. When you understand what it's like all the way at the bottom and those little nuances that you learn as a bus boy and, and other positions entry level. And uh, that's one of the things I love about in and out We used to get so many great applications from people in the restaurant industry and, Immediately, they thought, well, I've got this huge background. I, I'm sure I can start as a manager or as an assistant manager. And it's like, no, you start at the bottom. You're going to be cleaning the dining room, making you know our minimum wage, which is usually more than the normal minimum wage. But still, just because you have this career doesn't mean you get a free pass. You learn at the bottom. And, uh, you know, that's a great company. They make average store manager they just announced makes over 150 grand a year. But they all started at the bottom. So, um, all right. So here you are. You've got this resume in front of the marketing director a number of times, and eventually you land in marketing. And uh, where did your career path go from there? Yeah. So uh, the great thing about marketing is once once you kind of understand the principles of marketing, you can really apply them to any industry. It's it's a little bit different than other. Uh, other career paths where maybe it takes you and it niches you into one particular area. And so that's what I really love about marketing too, because I'm one of those people that likes to just, I, you know, I, I don't like to sit still. And so uh, I don't want to say that it's kind of an, you know, ADD or ADHD type of thing, but I definitely like to bounce around. And I think that with, uh, you'll find that with marketing and creative people that you, we're a little scatterbrained, I guess, maybe that's the best way to say it. And so um, I was, I was, I had, opportunities in lots of different industries, including uh, Hublot, which was a high-end Swiss watch company. And that was back in 1998 before they were really just making the entrance into the U.S. And now they're, I, I think most people who are around watches or collect watches know the name Hublot. Um, they were actually the first company to have the rubber strap, um, the rubber band as the, as the strap on the watch. And that became hugely popular about 10 years ago with the, in the luxury watch world. Uh, I moved on to work in a couple of ad agencies and uh, I was lucky enough to spend five years as the head of marketing for an investment bank, which is uh, which was founded by Tom Ricketts, who's the owner of the Chicago Cubs. And so that was a really cool experience. Got to do a lot of sports marketing there. And our connection, you and I, um, she, uh, Kristen Hager, she and I worked together on uh, some UFC events back uh, about six or seven years ago, which was a really, really cool moment in my career. And then recently, I've been uh, spending time working on the software side of the business. So several years, uh, three years now, three and a half years in the software as a service industry. Uh, and that's been exciting as well as, you know, obviously with things like AI, machine learning and um, Internet of Things, it's a really exciting place to be. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, that's, that's really my career in a nutshell. I mean, that's 23 years of uh, marketing. Yeah, well, you've certainly got a great background. Yeah. 
um, you know, one of the things that we talked about um, was about legacy and being on the fence, you know, and where you're going to go. But I think some of that came from maybe a little bit of a self-pity party. And, and I'd love to talk about that because.